Galatians chapter 6. Last chapter of Galatians, Galatians chapter 6. We're going to read verse 13 and 15. I don't have anything against 14. I'm just going to leave it out this morning. But you feel free to read it if you want to. Galatians 13, um, Galatians chapter 6, verses 13 and 15. When you find it, if you can, we stand as we honor the reading of God's word together. Galatians chapter 13, or chapter 6, starting in verse 13, it says, For those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. For neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. You see, Paul is writing to the Christians in Galatia, and the Christians there are a mixture of Jews and Gentiles. But of course, in the first century, many of the Orthodox Jews who did not convert to Christianity were stirring up controversy within the fledgling Christian church by teaching Judaism and keeping the law as a means of salvation as opposed to this newfound faith in Christ. And in this case, he's saying the Jews who are circumcised don't even really keep the law themselves. They're just as guilty as everybody else. Nevertheless, they want you new converts to be circumcised so that they have something to boast over. Look at all these new circumcised people that we have brought into the fold. But what he's saying here is that it doesn't really matter whether you're circumcised as a Jew or whether you're uncircumcised as a Gentile. Circumcision is not the issue. The issue is a new creation. Have you been made new by the blood of Jesus? Circumcision is an interesting topic we find in Scripture, and that's going to kind of be our focus this morning during our message. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll get started. Father God, thank you for today and this message, Lord, that is forthcoming. I pray that you will empty me out of myself and just, Lord, fill me up with your spirit, Lord, and speak through me and to me. Lord, that we might all, myself included, hear whatever it is that you have to say to us today. Lord, that we may learn from it intellectually, but also with our hearts. God, and that we might apply it to our lives and be molded more closely, Lord, into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, as a result. For we pray it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. As you're being seated, you can turn back now to our main text, which is Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17, as we continue our sermon series, The Chosen Church, a study of the patriarchs, or getting to know the patriarchs, this morning. We started back in Genesis chapter 12, we met a man named Abram and his family. In Genesis chapter 12, God first spoke to Abram and introduced him. To Abram, the promises that he was making to Abram as his chosen one to be the patriarch of his chosen people, Israel. At the time that God first appeared to Abram in Genesis chapter 12, Abram was 75 years old. In verses 1 through 3, he made some grand promises to make Abram a great nation. Make of his descendants a, a, a great numerous number of people that would someday form a great nation. The nation of Israel, we later find out that it becomes. But he also promised that he would give them a land to possess, a land to be their own, and that they would be a blessing to all of the earth. So Abram followed the Lord's direction and he traveled to the place that God showed him, the land of Canaan. And God appeared to Abraham a second time at the Oak of Morah in Genesis 12, 6 and 7. And he pledged to him 
to give all of the land that he could see, all of the land that was around him to his descendants as an everlasting possession. Sometime thereafter, after Abraham had made his trip to Egypt and returned, God again appears to Abram, Abram in, in Canaan. And for a third time, reiterates all of the promises that he had made previously. We find this account in Genesis 13, 14 through 17. We've already looked at all of these stories. And then sometime even after this, God formalizes all of these promises by ceremoniously establishing an official covenant. You remember in Genesis chapter 15 when we did that message that Abram divided the animals in half and laid them out and, and God in the form of a, a furnace and a torch went through and, and made a covenant oath to fulfill all of the promises that he had been making to Abram all of this time. And yet, despite all of these different scenes, despite all of these different instances and interactions that we've seen repeatedly over the course of Abram's life over the last 25 years, yet still no fulfillment. The years kept coming and going and Abram kept waiting. This morning... Our message is titled, The Sign of Circumcision. And in this message, we will discuss yet another encounter between Abram and God, which relates to all of these promises and this ancient covenant. Perhaps this morning we'll begin to see maybe the wheels set into motion and perhaps some tangible fulfillment of these promises beginning to unfold. So let's turn to our text as we begin this morning. The first point is called a new name. A new name. Starting in verse 1, it says, Now when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked to him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I will make you a father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make the nations of you the kings and and kings will come forth from you, and I will establish my covenant between you and me and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And I will give to you the land and the land to, the, to your descendants after you, the land of your sojournings, all of the land of Canaan, for it will be an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So... When we look back at verse 1, Abram is now 99 years old. Last week when Ishmael was born, in the previous chapter, Abram was 86. So 13 years have passed between chapter 16 and chapter 17. Abram is now 99 years old. And the Lord appears to him again, as he has done on previous occasions, which we just recounted just a while ago in the introduction. And again, God repeats and reiterates the promises that he had made already. There's, there's nothing new here. God had already on multiple previous occasions told Abraham that he would make of him a great nation. That he would give him and his descendants the land of Canaan. And yet, from the age of 75, when the original call came, into chapter 17, and this encounter with God, when Abram is 99, 24 years have passed. And during this long span of time, God has periodically appeared to Abraham, 
or Abram and spoken with him to reassure him of the promises that he had made and to remind him of them and to encourage him and to tell him I've not forgotten you or my word. However, when we get to chapter 17 and this episode, we see some differences. The first one is, God gives Abram a new name. You saw that in verse 5. God changes Abram's name into Abraham. Now, the name Abram means, in the Hebrew, exalted or high father. But the name Abraham is a variation of that. The name Abraham means father of a multitude. Father of a multitude. If you look in verse, verse 4 and verse 5, you see this language. God saying, you will be a father of a multitude of nations. You will be a father of a multitude of peoples. And so the name Abraham is actually an expression of this very idea. The name Abraham means a father or the father of a multitude. Abraham's name itself now is a reflection of the covenant of God. The Lord changed his name so that it would be an expression and a constant reminder anytime you say Abraham of God's promise to Abraham that he would be the father of a multitude of nations, a multitude of peoples. Whenever God changes somebody's name in scripture, it's a significant act. We can think of a few different examples. God changed Abram to Abraham here. Later in this chapter, we'll see that he's going to change Sarah's name to Sarah. Later in this series, we will discover that he's going to change Abraham's grandson, Jacob's name, into Israel. We'll get to that in a few months. But there are other examples as well. Jesus changed Simon's name into Peter. We know that Saul's name was changed to Paul. When God changes a person's name, there's a reason for it. He is giving them a new identity. He is giving them a new purpose or a new mission. You see, our, our name is so valuable. When you call a person's name, it brings to mind the entire character and the entire personality, the entire being of a person. It's all wrapped up in their name. Their name is the expression of who they are. And so when you change somebody's name, it's, a, it's an extremely significant event. To change a name is, is indicative of a transformation. It's, it's a passage from the old to the new. It's a passage from that which was former to that which is current and future. It is something that is that is so important and significant did you know that scripture says that god will give a new name to every triumphal believer god will give a new name to every triumphal believer In revelation chapter 2 Verse 17, 
John writes the following. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. Oftentimes during this ancient period, those who were victors, those who were winners, were given white stones as an award for overcoming, for enduring whatever it was that they were going through, whatever contest or whatever, whatever it was. And it would have a name written on it. Scripture says, for all born-again believers, there will be a day when the Lord will give us a new name. And that name will reflect our identity in Christ. That name will, ref will reflect the transformational change that the Lord has made in our life. We, like Abraham, will have a new name given to us by God himself. The second point this morning is called a covenantal sign. A covenantal sign as we continue now in verse 9. God further said to Abraham, Now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations, and this is my covenant which you shall keep between me and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. And every male who is among, who is among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who is born in the house, or a foreigner bought with money, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, a servant who is born who is bought with money from a foreigner who is not of your descendants. A servant who is born to your house or who is bought with money shall surely be circumcised. Thus shall be my covenant with you and your flesh for an everlasting covenant. But the uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of the foreskin, that person shall be cut off from my people. He has broken my covenant. So the Lord in these verses now goes on to describe a physical procedure which would be used to delineate or to signify and set apart those who are partakers of the Abrahamic covenant. He says that Abraham who is at this point 99 years old, and all of the males in his family, including all of the males of his servants, both those servants that were born in his household and those servants that he purchased, that he acquired, all of the males in Abraham's house were to be circumcised as a physical sign of the covenant. And in addition to this, going forward throughout the generations, all boy babies, when they got to be eight days old, were to be circumcised. Again, as a mark or a sign that they were Hebrew, that they were Jewish, that they were a descendant of of Abraham and a partaker of God's covenant to Abraham. Centuries later, when we get to the time of Moses and the Exodus, we see that this practice, this command, this instruction is actually written into the Mosaic law. It becomes part of of the Old Testament law. But it was actually established well before the law was written. 
the passage uh, or the rite of circumcision began with Abraham and his family. Nowadays, and it has been now for hundreds and hundreds of years, all Jewish boys, when they get to be eight days old, are circumcised. As a matter of fact, if you remember in the New Testament, Mary took Jesus to the temple when he was eight days old, and this, this is the reason they went, so that he could be circumcised. God declared that circumcision would be a physical sign or a mark that would designate his chosen people. Now, there are, are evidences of the fact that other ancient cultures besides just the Hebrews practiced circumcision. However, they did not practice it as an indicator or as an expression of their covenant relationship with God. Most of them practiced it kind of as a rite of passage from boyhood into manhood. And they didn't do it to babies. They did it to young, young men, youth, or, or, or boys. But the Jews were the only people who specifically used circumcision and view it as a sign of God's covenant. The Lord further told Abraham that if any male remained uncircumcised they would be in violation of the covenant and therefore they would be uh, they would not have access to privileges to the covenant promises that God had made to Abraham as a matter of fact those who were uncircumcised were restricted from participating in many and still are today many uh, Jewish customs and traditions. Scripture says that such a person, an uncircumcised person, or someone who chose to remain uncircumcised, should be cut off from his people. In other words, you should identify them and you should uh, cut them off from the group. If they're not willing to be circumcised and identify themselves, as a Jew, then you need to uh, exclude them from the fellowship. There are certain things that they just aren't going to be allowed to do. Now, what I want you to understand is that this, this old covenant was a fleshly covenant. It was a physical covenant. The way that you became a, a partaker in the covenant was through natural birth, and or through acquisition as a servant of one who was already part of the covenant. It was, it, it, it was based on ethnicity. It was based on physical lineage and ancestry. And because it was a physical covenant, then the sign of the covenant was also a physical sign. Circumcision. But what I want you to understand in light of the New Testament and as we understand it as Christians today, Jesus fulfilled and established the Old Covenant. And he replaced it with a new and a better spiritual covenant. If you remember our study through Hebrews a couple of years ago, that was what the entire book of Hebrews was about. Jesus is better. You remember that? We talked about all the ways that Jesus not only fulfilled the old covenant, but made it new and better. And now it's a spiritual covenant. And the sign of the new covenant is baptism. Water baptism. It's a sign. It's a symbol. And just like circumcision should take place shortly after birth... Baptism should take place shortly after a person is born again. Not necessarily eight days specifically, but within short order. Because it is an expression of the new birth. It is symbolic. It is a sign. And just like circumcision 
identified a young boy as a Jew, so also baptism identifies a new believer as a Christian. So you can see that there's some parallel between circumcision and baptism. Baptism identifies a newly redeemed Christian as a member of God's people, the church. And while it's just an outward symbol, and it doesn't necessarily save you, at the same time, God told Abraham, if somebody refuses to be circumcised, you should cut them off. If they won't identify with you as the people of God, then why, why should they be there? And you get the same kind of idea with baptism. Baptism won't save you, but baptism identifies you with the church. That's why we as Baptists recognize baptism as the, the act or the necessary act for joining the church to identify yourself with the body. And if you don't want to identify yourself with the body and you refuse to be baptized, then why, why should the church... If you don't want to identify with the church, why should we identify with you? There's, there's, a, there's a parallel, if you will, between the Old Testament procedure of circumcision and the New Testament practice of baptism. Let's continue. The third point is called a second son. We're going to deviate from our discussion of circumcision for just a minute, starting in verse 15. And then God said to Abraham... As for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarah, but Sarah will be her name. And I will bless her, and I will indeed give her you a son by her. And then I will bless her, and she will be the mother of nations. Kings and peoples will come from her. And Abraham fell on his face, and he laughed. And he said in his heart, Will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said, Oh God, oh that Ishmael might live before you. But God said, No, your wife Sarah will bear you a son. And you shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him. And I will make him fruitful and multiply him exceedingly, and he shall become the father of twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. And when he had finished talking to him, God went up from Abraham. So as I said earlier, not only did God change Abram's name to Abraham, but now he changes Sarah's name as well. God tells Abraham to rename his wife Sarai, which meant something along the lines of contentious, to Sarah. Sarah has a much nicer name than contentious. Sarah means princess. You see, Sarah would become the princess of many multitudes to follow. Future kings of great nations would be birthed from Sarah and those who follow. Kings of Israel, kings of Edom, kings of other nations would come from her line. But do you notice what Abraham does when God makes this prediction? He falls on his face and he laughs. He laughs and says, God, how in the world is a guy who's 100 years old going to have a kid? How is my wife Sarah going to birth a child? She's 90 years old. But God's not, but God doesn't budge. <laughs> And Abraham says, you know what, God? 
I've already got a son. Ishmael. Remember Ishmael? Now Ishmael was born of Hagar. The maidservant. We talked about this last week. Sarah got the idea that she would help God along in, in keeping his promise. And it wasn't happening fast enough. So she, she sent Hagar in to Abraham. And, and Hagar became the surrogate mother uh, for, for Sarah, who was, who was barren. And, and Hagar bore a child. His name was Ishmael. And, of course, we talked about all of the inner turmoil in the house that this caused. And we'll see that continue to play out. But the point is... He already had a son who uh, now was a teenager. And Abraham perhaps, perhaps because he was concerned about the trauma that his wife would go through at nine years old trying to carry a child, said, you know what, God, why don't you just, why don't you just establish the covenant through Ishmael? But God said, no. You don't get to dictate what my plan is. I will tell you what my plan is. My plan is Sarah will have a child. And the covenant will be established through him. Not that God hates Ishmael. God told Abraham, I love Ishmael. I'm going to bless Ishmael. He's going to become a great nation himself. But the covenant will not be established through him. It will go through Isaac. The name Isaac Kind of ironically, I guess you could say, the word Isaac means he who laughs. He who laughs. Abraham laughed at the thought that he would have a child. And now every time he says Isaac, he's reminded of that. Not only does Abraham laugh, we're going to see next week that Sarah laughs also when she hears the news. But the covenant would go through... Isaac. So God also told Abraham that Sarah would give birth to this new son in about a year's time. This season, next year. Now, before we just pass over that statement, I want you to think about that for a minute. If it was still going to be a year until Sarah had the child, pregnancy only lasts nine months. So that means at the time of this promise, Sarah was not yet pregnant. It also tells us that God did not cause her to become pregnant. In other words, Isaac was not conceived like Jesus, where it was an immaculate conception. Sarah would have to become pregnant. Which meant, not to get overly graphic, but you can read between the lines, Abraham had some work to do in the next couple of months. God made the promise, but he said, you're going to have to act on the promise in order to bring about the fulfillment of the promise. Not just you, but Sarah as well. You're going to have to look past your circumstances... You're going to have to put aside your age. You're going to have to put aside your health conditions. You're going to have to put aside all of these obstacles you see in front of you. And you're going to have to take my words and my promise and you're going to have to believe it. And then in order for it to come into fulfillment, you're going to have to act on it. There's a lesson there. God says, this is going to happen. I'm going to make it happen. But I'm going to involve you in the process. And there is work for you to do. I'm not just going to do it by myself. I could. But I'm not. And that's a lesson for all of us today. We have to believe God. Follow His direction and act in accordance with His will to bring about his purposes. The difference being, as they acted this time, they would be acting in accordance with what God told them to do. When they acted back in chapter 16, 
by, ha by having a son through Hagar, they were acting, but they weren't acting in accordance with what God told them to do. And thus, all sorts of problems ensued. We need to act with God's direction and blessing to bring about his purposes. Let's close this chapter out with the last section called an obedient act. Starting in verse 23. Then Abraham took his son Ishmael and all of his servants who were born in the house and all who were bought with his money. Every male among the men of Abraham's household and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin on the very same day as God had said to him. Now Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised to the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And in the very same day, Abram was circumcised and Ishmael, his son, and all of the men of his household. All who were born in his house were brought with his money from a foreigner were circumcised with him. So in keeping with the Lord's command, following God's divine instruction, Abraham gathered his son and all of his family members, including his servants, both those that were born in his household and those he had purchased or acquired, gathered them all together, and they were all circumcised on the same day. At that time, Abraham was 99 years old. And his son Ishmael was 13. And in so doing, this group of men became the first of literally thousands and thousands and thousands who would follow to be circumcised in accordance with their tradition and then later the law. Which, which actually codified this process into, into godly statute. And thus they were initiated into the Abrahamic covenant, a covenant of flesh, through circumcision. Now without being overly graphic, let me just quickly say, circumcision is the removal of the foreskin from a male penis. The foreskin serves no meaningful bodily purpose. It's, it's kind of like maybe an appendix. You can have it cut off or taken out or removed. And it doesn't cause any lasting or, or, or really noticeable change or difference. Obviously, this procedure limits a, a boy or a man's ability to work or to move about comfortably for a, a short period of time. Typically, circumcisions heal in about seven, five to seven days. They take longer and are more painful the older you get, which is why most circumcisions are practiced on babies or done on babies. Nowadays, in Western culture, a lot of times, new baby boys would be circumcised on the same day that they're born. They don't even wait eight days, but in the Jewish culture, they wait eight days. But obviously, when this was established, there were grown men who had to be circumcised in order to kind of get the, the process started, including Abraham. Nevertheless, modern medicine has shown that circumcision might have even some health benefits. And a lot of people circumcise their young boys for the health benefits. It has nothing to do with religion or with faith. There is no female equivalent for circumcision. Uh, there are procedures that are done on women that are more mutilation than they are circumcision and should not be done. But obviously the anatomy of men and women is different. And I know that it's a different message, but there are differences between men and women. We live in a culture who somehow can't see that in some places, but this is an area where it's pretty obvious. Anyway, let me wrap up. Preachers oftentimes will use the phrase or a phrase similar to the children of God or the people of God. 
And this phrase identifies or, or describes a particular group. But it's important to realize that phrases like the children of God or the people of God can have different shades of meaning depending upon the context in which they're used. Let me explain. There are those who belong to the physical, natural, ethnic people of God. Such as those that we're talking about here in this passage. The cho they're the chosen ones under the old covenant. They are designated to serve as God's representatives on the earth. They have become known commonly as the Jews. They are the people of God in a physical, earthly sense. But there are also those of all backgrounds, all races, all nations, all ethnicities. I'll get it out if I keep trying. Including Jews, but also Gentiles. A universal group, collection, of all of those who are spiritually redeemed. These are the spiritual people of God. And they are a part of the group through faith in Jesus Christ. We call these people of God Christians. So you have the natural people of God. You have the supernatural people of God. And let me just add another element. It's possible to be both. It's possible to be a Jew and a believer in God and in Christ. As a matter of fact, most of the prominent named Christians in the New Testament were Jewish. And they became believers. And so they were circumcised in the flesh to identify as themselves with the Jews, but they had also been born again and become the people of God through faith in Christ. As a matter of fact, Abraham himself would be a member of both groups. Circumcised in the flesh, but one who had faith unto righteousness in God, salvation. And so it's important when you hear the phrase people of God, you determine in your mind, okay, what is this pastor talking about? Is he talking about the natural people of God, the Jews? Is he talking about the spiritual people of God, the Christians? Because what I'm telling you is, circumcision of the body had nothing to do with salvation. It had to do with identifying yourself as one of the partakers of the Abrahamic covenant. Which was a covenant that said, I am a descendant of Abraham, I am a Hebrew, and I am one of the many that will live in this land and have an everlasting inheritance uh, of this land on earth, Canaan, the promised land. It had nothing to do with salvation. Not every circumcised person is saved. Circumcision doesn't save you. And I would just add to that, the new circumcision I mentioned a while ago, baptism, also doesn't save you. Baptism is also simply a symbol. Not all Baptist, uh, I'm sorry, not all baptized church attenders are saved because they were baptized. These are outward physical signs. What matters is the new creation, which I read in the beginning. And I want to close by looking at how Paul explains this in Romans chapter 2. Remember, Paul was a Jew. Paul was a Pharisee. Paul had been circumcised in the flesh. Paul knew all of the tradition and the law regarding circumcision. But Paul also met Christ on the Damascus Road. And he was changed and he became a believer. And look how he 
explains this in Romans 2, 28 and 29 as I wrap up. It says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. He is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. You see, believer, beloved, true circumcision unto salvation occurs in the heart. Man can circumcise your flesh, but only God can circumcise your heart. And when God circumcises your heart, what he's doing is he's putting a mark on you and he is identifying you as one of his chosen. One of his very own. Down here at the bottom it says, Circumcision of the flesh was a visible sign of the old covenant. Circumcision of the heart is an invisible mark, which only can be made by God unto salvation. Circumcision is a fascinating procedure, and we read about it throughout Scripture and see how it was important to the Jews and how it takes on a new meaning in Christ Jesus. And it's important that we know and understand it so that we can have a greater and fuller and richer understanding of God's word. But what I'm telling you there this morning is that the only true circumcision that matters is circumcision of the heart. And the way that that happens is when you come to faith in Jesus Christ and you trust him as your Lord and Savior and he comes into your life and he circumcises your heart. He transforms you. He makes you into something new and he marks you as his own. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ, if you've never experienced the circumcision of the heart, I want to encourage you to do so during this invitation. If you have, and I trust all of us have, but if you have and you know of others who need to experience the circumcision of the heart, to know about Jesus, I would encourage you to pray for them and to talk to them and to share with them the good news of Jesus this week.